as a physician, you have a great deal of negotiating power. Thank you for joining us today on Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. I'm Dr. Jen Barna. I'm here today with the best employment attorney I have known. He has been helping me since the late 1990s and countless other physicians and medical providers to draft and negotiate physician contracts and medical provider contracts. I am thrilled to have Jim Barna here, my husband, employment attorney and expert. Jim, thank you so much for coming on with us to give us some tips about ways to negotiate physician contracts that take into account some work-life balance factors that we should be looking for. Thinking back, you've helped me just by giving me ideas of what would be expected in different specialties, types of contracts that actually helped me to make decisions in medical school. And then all the way through contract negotiations, helping me to look out for different factors that were important in a contract. So Can you give us some tips today on what to look for when we're negotiating our contracts? Sure. And, you know, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very excited about doc working. And as you know, this is a subject matter that I can go on about for hours. So, you know, what I'm going to be doing here is just sort of a real rough sketch of the importance of physician contracts and how to negotiate them. And, you know, what to look out for so you don't get caught in some of the pitfalls. So one of the things I want your viewers to think about as physicians and other medical professionals is that in your career, in your training, physicians particularly have learned to be really stoic about how they go about their work. When you're in medical school, residency and fellowship, you're always taught to just tough it out and to deal with situations by doing more work, and giving more of yourself. And that's great from a training standpoint, but once you get into practice, there are some real conflicts with that. And, you know, certainly those sorts of conflicts are some of the things that are discussed at Doc Working. So here's just some tips about how to deal with that. The first thing is when you start thinking about a job you want, whether it's right out of a fellowship or residency, or if you're changing jobs during your career, the first thing you got to do is really find out everything about that job that you possibly can. And what I mean is it goes a lot further beyond what most doctors think about. You want to get to the point where you're not only talking about the employees at that practice that you're thinking about joining, talking to the partners, but also talking to other physicians in the community to sort of get an idea of the reputation of that practice and trying to find out if there are any problems or issues that could come up that could really affect your work-life balance. Things like call schedule and whether the practice is structured in a way to favor older doctors versus younger doctors, knowing how strong the contractual relationships that the practice has are, and you know what's happening within the medical community there. Those are all really important things that can easily affect your job with that practice or hospital. But in addition to that, it can really have an impact on your work-life balance. So number one, find out everything you can about the practice, good and bad, before you even begin to negotiate the contract. Secondly, all physician contracts should be in writing. Whether it's what we call an at-will contract, which is a normal employment situation, or a contract that goes a period of time and may lead to partnership, no matter what, that has to be in writing. Next step, every physician, no matter how much you hate the legal profession and legal verbiage, you've got to get comfortable with reading through the entire employment contract and knowing exactly what is meant and the implications of what it's meant to your career. Every physician is highly intelligent. And if they sit down for an hour, they can tease their way through an employment contract. And if there's anything that you don't understand what the heck that is or the implications of it, well, just circle it in red and make sure it's something that you are able to find out about to your satisfaction. With regard to an employment contract, every specialty has different forms that employment contracts take. 
you know, a neurosurgeon's employment contract is going to be radically different from a pediatrician's contract. And each specialty is going to have, you know, by convention, benefits and things in it that can benefit you as an employee if you know about it. So, you know, for example, there may be things that you aren't told to ask for, but are, you know, easily acceptable within your employment contract. For example, just to throw something out. If you're seeking a job in Southern California or in Hawaii, where housing prices are out of control, if it's a partnership-based practice, they may have some subsidy for you in terms of housing. They might not ever tell you that, but you know, in situations where housing prices are very high, that's often something that they have to put in there to seal the deal if it's asked for. So you want to think about the things that you want to see in that contract in terms of features, but you also want to think about what could go wrong. You know, for example, what if you're in a practice and it loses its main hospital contract two years into your practice? You know, that may result in you staying with that practice. That may result in you leaving that practice. But you want to make sure that if that bad thing happens, you have as much flexibility as possible. One thing that I always impress upon physicians is that as a physician, you have a great deal of negotiating power. You're going to be a major revenue generator for your practice or for your hospital. And since you are one of those revenue generators, you have negotiating power to try to get things set up the way you like them when you negotiate your employment contract. And just to talk about non-competition agreements. These can also be called restrictive covenants, and a non-competition agreement is basically a clause where your employer is trying to dictate what your behavior is going to be after you leave your employment. So, for example, you know, it may have a limitation on what hospitals you can practice at, what geographic area. It can exclude you for a set period of time, and it could exclude you for a given subject matter. So, for example, if you're a primary care doctor who has another specialty that they do and you're working under that specialty, they could restrict you from working in that specialty in the hospitals or in the community that you're used to practicing at. Now, my advice generally is if you can avoid a non-competition agreement, do so at all costs. And the way you do that is when you get one, you're going to need to ask some questions to the person who you're dealing with regarding the contract. Have you had any problems in the past regarding doctors competing against you? Why is it this hospital, this hospital, this hospital? Why is it so long? What are you concerned about? And, you know, usually with those sorts of quick questions, you can begin to sort of chip away at that non-competition agreement. And if you do it nicely enough and long enough, you may get to the point where they just go, we're just going to throw out this non-competition agreement altogether. That's the best case scenario is to just not have a non-competition agreement. So Jim, one of the questions I have for you is, is there ever a time at which you have to pick and choose your battles when you're negotiating a contract? Yes, that's an important consideration that the physician has to keep in mind when they're working with a private attorney. You want to make sure that you have an attorney who's got enough experience to know that when you're negotiating a physician contract, You know, you're trying to get the best deal possible, both for you and for the institution or the employer. So if it seems like your attorney might be coming on real strong, you know, that should be a bit of a red flag. You want an attorney who's going to look at the whole situation, know what your priorities are in terms of the contract, but also be able to get a successful contract negotiated where everyone involved is satisfied and happy going forward, you know, that this is going to be a good employment situation or a good practice situation. Is it ever the case that a physician would be best off to speak to their attorney up front and say, my goal is to negotiate this contract and ultimately accept this job? Yeah, I think anytime you're going into a job negotiation situation, You want to have a conversation with your attorney where you set out what your priorities are and what your goals are. 
But you want to make sure that this attorney knows that if it's a job that you really want to take, that they're not going to do anything that will be negative in terms of the goodwill that the parties are bringing toward the negotiation. If I'm a physician applying for a job or, or negotiating a contract, should I be negotiating that myself and then I interact with my attorney or should my attorney be negotiating it for me? Yeah, so that's a really important consideration and it really depends on a lot of factors. The number one factor is you as the physician. Do you feel comfortable that you can get your priorities across to the person you're negotiating with at the new practice? Do you feel like you have a broad enough grasp of the situation? Anyone who's going to be competent in negotiating their own contract has to be able to figure out every last implication that the wording of the contract has. So, you know, if you feel confident with that, then it's perfectly reasonable for the attorney to sit in sort of the second seat and, you know, not even be an active part in the negotiation. You want to be able to consult with that attorney to know, you know, what the pitfalls are and where you have opportunities in the negotiation. But if that's the case, then, you know, having that attorney sort of reviewing things and being a little bit behind the scenes can be perfectly reasonable. Now, if you're the sort of doctor where you don't feel comfortable in those situations, or if, for example, American culture or American legalese is something that you're going to have difficulty with, in those situations, that's where you really want to have the attorney take a more active role in acting on your behalf. But they're always acting on your behalf. So the overwhelming thing is for you to have your attorney know what's important for you and what your goals are with the negotiation. And one last quick question. You mentioned before that negotiating a non-compete agreement is a top priority to negotiate that part of your contract so that you're not tied into a non-compete agreement if you can. However, are there cases where that might not be your top priority and maybe you need to pick your battles and maybe focus on something else in the contract and maybe for some people there are circumstances where they're okay with a non-compete? Yeah, that's true. It really just depends on how entrenched the hospital or the employer is with regard to the issues related to the non-compete. As we've discussed previously, there are certain ways to sort of ask questions about the non-compete to see how important it is for the institution to have that. Often non-competes are put into place by the attorneys and the institutions don't have a whole lot of skin in the game in terms of what those provisions are. I see what you're saying. So you're saying it may not even be that important to the institution. And if that's the case, it would be easy to strike it. And if you can strike it, you should. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't even use the term striking it. I would just talk about broadening it, loosening it, relaxing it. In business, you have some companies who have been really burned by employees who've left and then gone into competition with them. And that's often what they're looking out for in a non-compete agreement. Now, the most important thing, of course, is for you, if you're going to be working under a contract where there's a non-compete agreement, you need to be comfortable with what the implications of that non-compete agreement are. If it's just a non-compete that prevents you from practicing or having privileges at a specific hospital, and there are five other hospitals within the area, well, then that may be something that's very easy to live with. However, if it's something that due to your specialty and your geographic location is effectively going to make you unable to practice your specialty without moving to another state or another metropolitan area, well, you want to consider that as a potential risk. I'm not saying that you shouldn't sign it if it's a good enough job, but you just have to know you know, if things go bad, what are the changes I would have to make to my practice because of this non-compete agreement? Right. Thank you so much for clarifying all of that. And thank you for coming and talking with me about this. Well, I really appreciate everything that you do. And you've helped so many physicians and you've helped me so many times along the way. And your advice is truly appreciated. Well, it certainly is my pleasure. Physicians are some of my favorite people in the world. And, you know, I think the legal implications of the medical field and physician employment and practice are just fascinating. And that's why I've sort of concentrated in that area throughout my career.
Well, thanks again. And if you're hearing a little bit of background noise during the last part of this conversation, it's because we took it out to Central Park in New York City. We are grateful for the ability to be out here recording in the middle of the day. And we appreciate you listening. Thank you for joining us on Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. We want to remind you that if you do want coaching support right now, all you have to do is go to docworking.com and you can check out our coaching opportunities for you to get a certified coach who is experienced in working with physicians. Also, if you're not on our newsletter yet, you got to get over to docworking.com today and sign up. That's how you find out about all kinds of offers and resources that we have available to you. So until next time, thanks so much for being with us here on Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. Hello, and thank you for listening. This is Amanda Taran. I'm the producer of the Doc Working Podcast. If you enjoyed our podcast, please like and subscribe. We would also love it if you checked out our website, which is docworking.com. And you can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram. On Instagram, we are docworking1, and that is with the number 1. When you check us out on social, please let us know what you would like to hear on the podcast. Your feedback really means a lot to us. And if you're a physician with a story you'd like to tell, please reach out to me at amanda at docworking.com to apply to be on the podcast. Thank you again, and we look forward to talking with you on the next episode of Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast.